more than 20 years ago is when I really started to get honest about my hearing loss or, or maybe when it really progressed. I was in acting school and I would notice I just couldn't hear anything. And, but I was in such denial. I was so ashamed. I was, I felt broken. I didn't want to tell anyone. And then it got worse and worse. And I, you know, like all the years of waitressing, I would squat down at tables. You know, I did everything so I could be, I could lip read. I think that's where I got really, really good at lip reading all the years of, of working in that restaurant with bad acoustics. You're listening to the MILF Podcast. This is the show where we talk about motherhood and sexuality with amazing women with fascinating stories to share on the joys of being a MILF. Now here's your host, the milfiest MILF I know, Jennifer Tracy. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. This is MILF Podcast, the show where we talk about motherhood, sexuality, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. I'm Jennifer Tracy, your host. I really hope you guys enjoyed my conversation last week with Wendy Miller. She is one of my new found favorite people. I just love her and that podcast episode was very entertaining for me to record and to listen to several times over after I got the edit back. And uh, also just a reminder for you to check out her podcast, Sex Ed the Musical, anywhere you listen to podcasts. It's really fun. Here we are. It's the end of April. What the F? I sound like a broken record, but I just, it just never ceases to amaze me how quickly the time goes. Today's guest is a really special friend of mine. Jennifer Pasteloff is someone who was a waitress at the Newsroom Cafe, which was a main staple of LA dining uh, for years. And they closed not too long ago. I think there's something else in its place on Robertson Boulevard across from the Ivy, the famed Ivy restaurant. And Jen was just so friendly and amazing and wonderful. And we just all became friends with her. And we would go, this was, I was in my early 20s. And my girlfriends and I would go and have dinner there and have lunch there. And Jen was always there and always working. And, and then I ran into her several years later when we were both getting our eyebrows done in Beverly Hills. I said, oh my God, how are you? She said, I'm, I'm amazing. I'm teaching yoga all over the world. My whole life has changed. And she just looked so bright and so happy. And we didn't really have time to get into all of it, but I went and looked her up and I got to see what she was doing. And so I've been, that was maybe 10 years ago eight years ago, something like that. And so I've been following her. And then when I did the podcast, I, she's been on my brain to ask her. And I asked her and she immediately said yes. And we reconnected and it was just such a soul sister moment. And she's got an incredible story. And she has a book coming out June 4th on being human. Uh, I've pre-ordered mine. I can't wait to get it in the mail. I'm so excited. And, you know, being a writer myself, I know what it takes to write a book and it's not a small thing. So I'm incredibly proud of her. You know, not only that, Jennifer, and she wouldn't share this because she's not going to advertise it, but she's incredibly, deeply, deeply generous in her service to people. So not only does she do these amazing retreats all over the world where people go and they do yoga and they do writing and they do emotional work and like just really tap into the joy of being, you know, human. She is very uh, philanthropic. So she will, we, and we do talk about it as I asked her about it a little bit in the interview. Um, she gets scholarships for women to come on these retreats who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it. She's constantly making people aware through her social media about this person needs help. They, you know, they're sick and they can't pay their medical bills, this person. And it's very specific and it's very just from her heart because she has a huge heart. It's just such an honor to know her. And I feel like we just need more of that in the world. Jen is just such a bright light. And, and Jen, I love you so much. I'm so glad you're here in the world. Here's my interview with Jennifer Pasteloff. Hi, Jen. Hi, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Jen squared. It's Jen squared. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you so much for sitting on my living room floor <laughs> and sitting right across from me so I could read your lips. It makes it so much easier for me. I'm so happy. Thank and you. I am holding in my hands, which feels very special because 
I'm not going to get my pre-ordered copy until June 4th, but I'm holding in my hand the copy of your book. You are. Yeah, uh, they call it a galley. It's an advanced copy. It's beautiful. Yay! It's pretty amazing. <sighs> so I'm just going to read the title of it because I want to. On Being Human, a memoir of waking up, living real, and listening hard. Jennifer Pasteloff. Yep. So can you tell us a little bit about this book? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I've been doing this Q&A on Instagram because I, I realized late to the party that you could do that. You just post, ask me right. anything. And I've been having fun with that. And someone said, um, what's the synopsis of your book? Oh, God. And I, <laughs> the wor- a writer's most yeah. hated question. But I went on video and I said, someone who wanted to die, that would be me. Who didn't, that would be me. And it's the truth. So it's not, you know, like... I end up this, you know, happy, um, all the time, perfect, amazing life in my big house with no pro you know, no, but it's, I found a way to put one foot in front of the other and deal with my depression and, um, talk about things and keep going. Right. So it's the keeping of the going. Yeah. It's my work, my workshops and my book. So, and it, you know, talks a lot about, um, grief, losing my dad at a very young age and how that affected my whole life and having an invisible disability and a whole bunch of other things. Um, my friend I had dinner with him the other day is this wonderful actor named Holt McCallany. He has a show on um, Netflix now called Mind Hunter. Shameless plug for that. But he read it and he's like, it's just, he said, it's like, it, it functions as three things. It's a memoir. It's kind of self-help, and it's an advertisement for your retreats, which it is, and and not on purpose. But I use that as sort of the through line. Like sure. The, well, it's your is, your wealth of experiences from yes. that. I mean, of course. Yeah. So it's it's a hodgepodge hybrid, which is my favorite thing. You know, it doesn't fit inside a box, yeah. which is makes me proud. Yeah. It's beautiful. I can't wait to read it. I'm so excited for you. I'm excited. I can't wait till the heart. That's, you know, a uh, paperback because it's the yes. galley, but the real book will be hardback. That's and what I'm getting in the mail. La, la, la. Right Thank when you. it comes Thank out. Thank you. For of course. I went yeah. right on you guys and you can go on Amazon right now and pre-order it. In fact, I'll include a link to that exact link in the show notes of this show. Yeah. So Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Indie Indie Bound if if you want to support a an independent bookstore. And I didn't know before I you know got in this world how important pre orders were. I had no idea. I mean they are everything. It's a big deal. Yeah, and especially for a first time author. Yeah. So it's it's not something I take like lightly how many people have pre ordered. I'm floored and so grateful. Yeah. It's super exciting. So amazing. I mean, it's an amazing accomplishment to write a book. So I want to kind of go so many things you already just mentioned, like invisible disability, your father dying when you were young. Where did you grow up? Isn't it funny? I had to think about it. Um, I just like, I was born in Philadelphia and I grew up in South Jersey, um, a town right across the bridge in from Philly called Pensacon. And then my father died. My mother relocated my sister and I out here to Santa Monica, just a few blocks away from where I live now, to start over with two little girls. And then um, about, I don't know, four four or five years into our move, decided, which at the time I thought she was insane, truly, to move us back to New Jersey. So move back to Cherry Hill this time, which is sort of everyone listening is probably like, I know the Cherry Hill Mall. <laughs> and then... Um, I went to NYU, and then I moved, my mom, God bless her, moved back to California again when I was 20. And so when I was 21, I came to take a semester off and be near my mom. I was going through a really hard time, and that semester turned into, I don't know, what year are we in now? (laughs) Yeah. 20 so something. Yeah. To the long answer to your question is I grew up really both. I still always consider East Coast, but now I've actually spent more time on the West Coast, yeah. California. But you do have a connection to the to New York. We've talked about this before, but I've seen it even in your Instagram. It's like when you get to go there, it feels oh, like yeah. home to you. Oh, I'd much rather live there. I just can't afford it. <laughs> I'm yeah. you know, not gonna lie. Yeah. I'm like, you know, we're uh, I have a very, I'm very grateful. I have this great apartment that I have a rent control and I've lived for a really long time. And so I'm able to have a, a certain lifestyle here that I would not be able to have yeah. 
anywhere else, I don't think. So, yeah. But New York, I just feel more alive there. Having said that, uh, you know, I do, I do go in spurts. So I don't know if living there in the winter would, I might change my mind rapidly. You might. It's the real deal. I mean, the winter there is, it's substantial. Not that you don't know that, but I'm just saying. Because I thought that too. I took my son to New York um, a couple of years ago to visit friends and he had never been. And he was just like, this is magic. Like we, we stayed right on Central Park. Our friends live on Central Park. And so Central Park was the backyard. But living there is a different deal. And we wouldn't live on Central Park <laughs> if we lived there. We would have to live in... But see, Not that's where I'd want to live. Of so course, it's, it's like gorgeous. If I can't do that. Yeah, but yeah. So okay. my heart's there. Yeah, on the East Coast. So, but you get to travel a lot now because of your work. I do. Yeah, I do. I feel like I live on an airplane, and um, oddly, I somehow still don't have that many airplane miles. So, if anyone listening <laughs> knows what I'm doing wrong, <laughs> but I lead these these workshops, these on being human workshops and retreats all over. So I spend a lot of time traveling, which I love. But now that I have an almost three year old and I don't get to bring him all the time, I love less because I hate being away from him. Yeah. So that's hard. It is really hard, but I have no choice. It's the only way that I make any money right now. So right, right now until right June now. 4th. Yeah. And then this book is going to be out uh, um, among other things, among other things. So, um, Okay, so you grew up sort of bicoastally, and then you landed here, twenty one, and stayed. Yeah, maybe that's when you met me. I know you didn't meet me that long ago, but almost that long ago, though. Yeah, we were in our we were twenty three, twenty four when we met. Okay, yeah. So I yeah I started working at the newsroom, which I was going to say readers, listeners. That's where we met. I was her server. Um. For many, 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 many years. I started working there when I was 21. And I worked there until I was 34, I think. It There's, doesn't even exist anymore. There's it doesn't even else exist. There. Yeah. Which I mean, pains me, actually, because I, I crave the food. Oh, the food <laughs> is know. really good. The food is I really crave good. that tuna deluxe. Mm. So you worked there, and then you, I hadn't seen you in a while, and I ran into you at Damone Roberts. And which is a an eyebrow salon. The eyebrow, eyebrow king? The eyebrow it? king. Yeah, the, the eyebrow. eyebrow king. And I said, Jen, I said, what are you doing? You said, I'm teaching yoga all over the world. Yeah. My whole life is blown up. I'm so happy. I've never been happier. I'm so happy. Oh, and you were just name. lit up. That's amazing. It was so incredible. I was so, probably drunk. No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally, I was not. I was not. I was not. You weren't, you weren't that kind of lit. I, mean, I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Yeah. I mean, especially anyone who knew me from that, you know, I think of it as like another lifetime ago when I was working there. I was so depressed and hated myself so much. So it felt like such a victory when I'd run into someone that knew me from then. Like, look, I made it. Yeah. I didn't die. I made it out. Yeah. I escaped. Yeah. Um, not necessarily from the restaurant because Lord knows tons of my friends still work in a restaurant, but escaped from that self-hatred, how deep in it I was. Yeah. Yeah, it's so. insidious I know. and it colors everything. And so how did you do it? The truth is antidepressants. I should have, I hate the word should, see that pillow over there? Don't should all, Don't over, should yourself. all over yourself. <laughs> I should have gone on, you know, when I was much, much, much younger, I prob probably wouldn't have dropped out of NYU. Um, but I, w I went to a therapist and he suggested that I go on meds and I thought he was an asshole. It was the first session, but he was right. He was kind of an a-hole, but he was right. And I went, and it was, um, it wasn't like a, a, you know, like a magic fix or a, it wasn't anything except all of a sudden there was like a pinprick of light where there was nothing. And all of a sudden there was possibility where I... You know, I was doing a ton of yoga and my friends all suggested I become a yoga teacher, which sounded like the most unappealing thing on the planet. But then I took the meds and about two weeks in, I thought, maybe I will just take a yoga teacher training. And it really was only because I thought, oh, I'm, this may be my way out of the restaurant. I just because I felt like I was stuck and there was no way out, no matter what. And so it um, immobilized me where I was immobilized before. It was just these tiny little, little, moments of hopefulness and of I'll tell you the biggest thing was 
I, I noticed maybe three days had passed where I hadn't obsessed on my body because it used to be that literally every thought in my head was, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm a monster, I'm fat, I need to, ex-, you know, I, I couldn't even be have a conversation with you because I was in my head. And so like maybe a day, two days, three days passed. That's when I thought, oh my God, these is something's shifting. So that's why I wish I had gone on earlier because it, it would have helped me. Um, but, but those meds, you know, led me to be able to take the teacher training and the teacher training, you know, I, then I started teaching yoga and then I started teaching yoga and I found this thing and that I'm good at and combined it with other things I was good at. And, you know, confidence begets confidence, I think, or I know. So I just started and I started really thinking outside the box, but I had to get that confidence first. You know, I had to get I felt for so long so unworthy when I worked at the newsroom. And anyone listening, you know, this restaurant was like in, in its heyday, it was like the place to be, but it was very Hollywoody, very. And at the time I was sort of pretending to be an actress and everyone coming in there was important in quotes, you know, having a meeting, making a movie, starring in a movie. And, and I felt invisible and which now is in hindsight silly because I'm the same exact person I was and I was defining myself that way really. Yeah. But. But we do that. That's what we do until we, I mean, I'll speak for myself, until I was able to let go of that old story that wasn't even mine. 100%. I call you it your know. bullshit stories. Yeah, my bullshit stories. Like, that's not mine. That's that's someone else's story. I don't even know whose it is. You know, it could be some person I never met. But I know. I wish I could go sometimes. I mean, not terribly. I'm not going to go start working in a restaurant again. But <laughs> Sometimes I do think, oh, if I can go in like the me of now and the body of now and the who I am now and go back, it would be such a different experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a, I love those movies. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I love those movies where the person goes back to high school as their older self. Oh, yeah. But, you know, they're in their younger body or whatever it is. Um, and it's just profound because it's that exact thing of like the stuff that you think you're going to care about. Or the, the stuff that you cared about in high school isn't doesn't matter. Yeah. And, you know, not everybody, not everybody equates their job with their worth or their body weight with their worth. Yeah. Or, or, you know, I was particularly vulnerable to that. And then being in, in that particular restaurant, too, and that in, in Hollywood, you mm. know, and it just fed on all my insecurities. Yeah, and, of course. And not to say every moment was miserable. But yeah. So you got your teacher training certification, you started teaching yoga, but then what happened? Tell me about the synergy of this thing that became, I don't want to call it life coaching. I don't want, I don't know what to call it. I it's don't just, either. You, it's a magic <laughs> thing either. that you do. It's the Jen Pasteloff thing. It's <laughs> unique unto itself. Charlie calls me Mommy Pasteloff. Oh. Uh, I know that we have different last names. So I say, what's my last name? It's Mommy Pasteloff. Oh. He drops the T. Mommy Pasteloff. So, um, I started teaching yoga and I I started hustling at the newsroom. I would I would I got these little business cards made and I started dropping them on every table with a check. I mean, now I think like the chutzpah yeah. that I had, I but I got a lot of private clients that way, which I don't do that anymore, but at the time and it was really good money and so I started teaching yoga and then I decided I said this statement out loud, which I laugh at now. I go, I want to be bi coastal. <laughs> And I, I think it was because of how I grew up. Yeah. But, you know, and everyone laughs now. They're like, you are. I'm like, well, yeah. If you want to call, I, I stay on my friend's sofa when I go there. <laughs> you know, I go there a lot. I'm yeah. not, it's not like I have an apartment there. But so I said, I want to I be bi coastal and um, I'm going to do a workshop. And I had no idea what that meant, first of all. So I had been hired by some life coaches, like real life coaches, to do, um, be the yoga teacher for their retreat and I had just become a yoga teacher so I was like I felt like the biggest con artist of all time because they were hiring me uh, a friend referred me and so I went and I watched what they were doing and I thought I, I think I could do this like something like this and so I decided I'm going to lead a workshop I had no idea what I was doing or what that even meant and somehow um I went back home, I went to Philly, and I, I went to this studio to take a class, and I said, 
I'd like to do a workshop here. And they said, yes, I had no idea what it was going to be on. I kind of, I, I, I had been listening to a lot of Wayne Dyer at the time. And so I, um, he talked about manifesting. So I, I called it in the very beginning, what are you manifesting in your life? And it was very much just all yoga, except I brought sticky notes and people wrote what they're manifesting on these sticky notes. And, but it was mainly just yoga. Now, the thing to know is I never did want to be a yoga teacher. <laughs> and so like as as I started doing this, I started writing more and putting my stuff out there on the internet and I started developing a, um, an audience. And I started do, kept doing these workshops and and the yoga part kind of started falling away. And what I started doing was being more honest and focusing more on vulnerability and telling the truth. And I just started getting more and more confident that I didn't have to make it a yoga thing. So I used to worry, well, if I didn't call it a yoga thing, how will I get people in the room? And I don't worry about that anymore. It took a long time, but I just don't. I don't call my retreats yoga retreats. I mean, sometimes people are there and they will call it that. But I never, you'll never hear me say, oh, I'm leading a yoga retreat in France. Or, um, so in time, I got confident enough. And now the, the yoga is there is just a way to get people more open. But sometimes people come in a wheelchair. People come who've never done yoga or who don't feel like doing it. And it's really just a, a way to, to take off some armor, mm. you know. But it's, um, it took really caring less what people think. Mm. Like, I'm just going to make this, this thing up. And I, the synergy came from putting things together that I was, that I was good at. And one is, despite my hearing loss, listening and making people feel really comfortable and safe and at home, mm -hmm. which, you know, something I've always been good at. Mm -hmm. Terrible waitress, really good at that, you know? So I was able to like cultivate this feeling in these rooms and I just started getting creative and, and using that, those gifts and the writing and the things I had learned, waiting tables and put it together. Your wealth of experience. Pretty much. And yeah. deciding that, you know, I call, I made up the thing called the just a box, you know, which is I'm just a mom. I'm just a waitress. Totally. Right. And I was like, well, fuck the box. Yeah. So I made up something that doesn't fit in kind of any, any, any just a box. And here I am doing it and yeah. doing really well. And I, still don't know what to call myself or yeah. how, you know, but it's working. And yeah. and I always say to people in my workshops, I hope that this inspires you not to do what I'm doing necessarily, but that you can create something that doesn't necessarily fit in kind of any stupid box or anything that anyone's told you. Yeah. And that is what I never realized, you know, in my 20s. Yeah. 30s, early 30s. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's hard to realize that too. And at the time, because we're the same age, there wasn't really, I mean, maybe there was and I just didn't notice it, but there weren't people really modeling that, not like they are today. I think you're right, but I also don't know because we didn't have, the internet wasn't so big. Now right. everything is so accessible. There's, yes. You know, overload of information. So the minute some someone's doing something, we find out about it. So I, I think there probably were people out there yeah. doing stuff, but the, we just didn't have access yeah. because of, you know, Instagram wasn't around. Yes, that's true. Thank that's God. True. Right? I'm sure they were. I'm sure they were. But you could you didn't have that daily dose of it like we do now. No, yeah. Which can be both empowering but also disempowering, depending on your your Instagram use. But that's a whole other podcast. So Agreed. I want to talk about your hearing loss because I really don't know how that came to be, if you were born with it, or can you tell me about that? Yeah. Um so, so right now, this is actually like heaven because we have these um, headphones, headphones on yeah. and then like through the mic. So it's just, I wish everything sounded like this, yeah. you know, this clear, but I, I think I always had hearing loss. I didn't know as a child, um, I was always told I didn't pay attention, you know, the, mm. the classic things you hear. Um, but I always had tinnitus, which the tinnitus I don't know which is worse, my hearing loss or the tinnitus. The tinnitus is, what's so hard about it is it's maddening. It really is like, it's a form of torture. And so like, especially when I don't have my hearing aids in, it's so loud. So it's a basically a constant ringing? Is that it's, it's a ringing, it's a humming, it's, a, it's, it's unbearable. And so the hearing aids make everything else louder so that the tinnitus isn't so, mm. I still hear it, but it's not, mm. you know. But when I don't have them in, sometimes I just like, I often wonder like how I make it through each day because it is so maddening and 
grading and it's torturous. Mm. It really is like a form mm. of torture and that will never go away mm. and that never does go away. Um, so I always had it and I, I didn't know. The only thing I remember, and I didn't realize this until about, I don't know, eight years ago or something, uh, I used to make this sound when I was a child, when I was concentrating. Um, like, I don't want to make it it's so obnoxious, but this like droning sound and people made fun of me. So I stopped. But what I was doing was trying to mimic the sound in my head. And I didn't realize that until about eight years ago. And it made me really sad. I was like, that's why I made that noise. I was mimicking the sound in my head. I never, I never talked about it. I never understood. And so um, more than 20 years ago is when I really started to get honest about my hearing loss or, or maybe when it really progressed. I was in acting school and I would notice I just couldn't hear anything. And but I was in such denial. I was so ashamed. I was. I felt broken. I didn't want to tell anyone. And then it got worse and worse. And I, you know, like all the years of waitressing, I would squat down at tables. You know, I did everything so I could be, I could lip read. I think that's where I got really, really good at lip reading all yeah. the years of, of working in that restaurant with bad acoustics. But it's progressively gotten worse. I was not born deaf, you know, the capital D. It's progressively gotten worse. So now, you know, without my hearing aids, I can't hear. It just sounds like garbled mm. um underwater language mm. and with them i can hear but i still have to read lips mm -hmm. so if i'm looking the other way i won't hear you right. i might hear a little sound but i i can't make it out my hearing aids are amazing and they're bluetooth so when i'm on the phone it goes right into it streams right into my oh, ears that's awesome. it, yeah so they're they're high tech and really great that's great. The first question I'm thinking is, does insurance cover that? No, no. <laughs> because I knew the answer was no, which yeah, is bad. Yeah, so I would, how I got these a few years ago was through someone did a GoFundMe, and I was able to get them. And, it, yeah, it was one of the first times where, you know, strangers all over were leaving money, you know, like, Jen helps me with her writing, or she's helped me at their workshop to really, it was kind of, you know, Ugh. I had to sit with that. Yeah. and um. It was humbling, and just in a few days, I got enough money so I could get. That's these. incredible. I know I could get these, and they're things. a game changer. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And yet, you know, they're already now three or something years old. So, like every few years, yeah, you know, there's going to be an upgrade or something better. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yep. And now yeah. my sister is hearing aids, it. so it's definitely something hereditary. Yeah. So I want to talk about your childhood and your dad passing away. Um, so he was 38 when he died. Yeah. How old were you? Eight. Oh yeah. So he was 38. I was eight. So yeah, 38 was, was a hard year. Because in, in my head as a child, I always thought 38 was... The end. The end. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it... <sighs> it was sudden. He died of a uh, heart failure? He had a stroke. He had oh. basically had hardening of the arteries and he he, you know... He, apparently he had the body of like a 90 year old man. He was 38. My dad smoked four packs of cools a day. My father did uppers and downers and he, um, ultimately it was the drugs that, that killed him. Mm. And so, but yeah, it was, it was sudden. It was sudden, sudden. And, and it was, you know, the event of my life. It shaped everything. And yeah. my mom, I was only 34 with two little girls and did the best she could. It's something that I, I think it's important to talk about, you know, when losing a parent so young, how it affects your whole life yeah, and how grief metabolizes or it doesn't and, you know, affects. It. I ended up trying to deal with it by becoming anorexic later in life and all these ways that I never, because I never cried when my dad died. I just said, I don't care. Mm. And so I just locked everything in my body, you know, and now the work of my life is, is unlocking it and helping other people unlock theirs and yeah. learning how to be in their body. But yeah, yeah, that's intense. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, I, I'm sad. My dad never got to be my son. Yeah. And yeah, but it is true. Like that, um, grief does, I feel like get locked in our bodies and I, I recently had a loss. My one of my best friends um, took her own life in October, and um, 
you know, I was in fight or flight mode when it happened and I was, I, I guess I cried. I don't know if I cried. I mean, you know, but I was like, just going and, you know, calling the family and helping her husband deal with stuff and, and prepping the memorial. And, and then it wasn't until about a month after the memorial, which was a month and a half after she died, that I ended up hitting my head on a pole because I do pole dancing class for fun. And I hit it so hard and I cried for like two hours after I hit it. I probably had a concussion and I should have gone to the hospital, but I didn't. But it was just like that physical, like yeah. my body needed to hit itself on the pole <laughs> And release that grief. Completely. And then it feels like, you know, I've been around people who do stuff like that and they were like, why? I can't, why can't stop? And it's scary to them. Why am I, why can't I stop? And it's just like, it's like, um, it's like an uncorking. Yes. You know? So, uh, yeah. And, and unfortunately, the longer we've buried shit in our body, the harder it is to uncork and the, the more damaging it is. Yeah. So yeah. really encourage people to, you know, what's the thing people are saying? Like, oh, I feel all the feels and, yeah. and um, yeah. you know, all of the things that I still struggle with and that I never knew how to do. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was in a support group. The topic kind of was meandering, and but uh, something was mentioned about, basically we were all talking about how we'll do anything to avoid pain, avoid emotional pain. Yeah. Anything. And it's just like, oh my God, yeah, that describes like my entire life. Even, you know, and I haven't had a drink or a drug in 20 years, but I still will do anything to avoid pain. It doesn't have to do with, you know, alcohol. It's like trying to avoid that emotional discomfort that I'm trying to teach my kid how to tolerate on a daily right. basis because it's part of life. It's just is part of life. Like there's going to be pain. There's, yes, we have fear. We have instincts. We have intuitions to keep us safe. You know, you don't walk across the street, you know, at a certain time. You don't walk down that creepy dark alley, certain things like that. But emotionally speaking and relationally speaking, it's like the things that I do to keep myself safe, you know, or I don't do it as much anymore, but I look at that like starving myself because mm-hmm. I thought I was not thin enough. You know, when I look at pictures of myself at that age, 20, 23, 24, I'm like, I was gorgeous. What was I even worried about? Like, you know, there's a quote. I, oh, my God. I was t- there was this woman at the gym this morning. I started working out with a trainer, which is great. I love um, that you're doing that. But yeah. So I mean, I, I, I can't really afford it, but it's like I get a discount because I work at Equinox. And it's good because it's helping me shift. You know, I remember... When I was so sick, if anyone would ever say you look healthy or you look strong, I would want to die. Yeah. And now people are like, you look strong. It's a compliment. I yeah. Think, oh, like I'm, I'm shifting how I look at myself and how I see myself and getting stronger is is great. And yeah. there was this one at the gym and she was doing something. I don't remember what. And she leaned, she like kind of got near me and I said, is what you're doing how you get such a good butt? Because obviously, I like butts. I complimented you <laughs> and yours. And she was like, she took off her headphones. She's like, oh my God, are you joking? And I said, no, you have. I mean, I've been, I was literally looking at her for like an hour. Just, she goes, I just had a baby. And I'm like, look at this. And she started pointing out all this stuff. And I was flabbergasted because honestly, I'd been, I'd been sitting here admiring her. And I just thought, man, this is what we do. This is. So I told her this quote of mine that I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, and it, you're going to probably nod your head in agreement, which is um, take a picture of your face and remember that in 10 years' time, you'll be amazed at how gorgeous you were. Be amazed now. Yes. Right? So, like, have you ever not found a picture of yourself from whenever and gone, I was so cute? And you go back to that, go back in time. In that moment, you were either like, I'm so fat, I'm yeah. ugly, I'm not enough, whatever. Ugh. I don't know why we don't remember that more. I know. It's so true. It's so true. Yeah, and this woman today, I mean, it was just hilarious because I thought, wow, if we can only see ourselves how other people see us. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, avoiding pain, which it's, it's, I think it's a human impulse because yeah. no one wants to, but knowing that it won't kill us. Yeah. Yeah. And that it'll pass. Totally. And I point that out to my kid all the time. When he goes through something hard emotionally, 
or in general, but mainly emotionally. And he's very sensitive, my little cancer boy. He's very emotional, very sensitive. I love that. And he will go through something. And then when it's done, and someone told me this, I think it was maybe our Rye teacher, our baby class teacher or something, but to point out after they've calmed down to say, I'm so proud of you, of how you you just navigated that for yourself emotionally. I love that. You're safe now. And you got through that. Yes, I'm here to hold you, like to hold space for you and love you always. And I can see that he gets it. Yeah. And I was never given that space. God bless my parents. They did the best they could. But it was basically like, don't cry. Don't be upset. Like, don't feel your feelings. Right. No, well, I think that's very different now. Like, I mean, yes. I'm sure there were some parents that were more hippy dippy yes. back in the day. But yes. it is different now. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think, well, I mean, we live in LA. So I, I know, think so it's we're a in little a bubble. insulated. What do, what do we know? But I do think there's more there's more awareness around that and, and child rearing. And, and also these kids are just so, I mean, well, your son is so little. He probably doesn't have YouTube yet, but. Are you joking? <laughs> He's better. He calls it iTube. He's better. <laughs> no, because obviously I, I win the like shittiest parent of the war, of, of the world war, because I let him have so much iPad. My I mean, son watches He knows constant. how to navigate. Yeah, but my son's two. He knows how, <laughs> <laughs> he knows how to navigate. I, I now I call it iTube YouTube. He knows how, he's better at the, working the phone than I am. Oh, it's yeah. so crazy. Um, now he's, he's getting a little better because he'll, he'll watch Paw Patrol. He'll just watch a show instead yeah. of just um, scrolling, scroll, scrolling, scroll, scroll. Yeah. yeah, because I noticed it was making him kind of a monster because of something immediate didn't go his way he starts hitting the yeah hitting the phone yeah. or the ipad yeah. and it, it created this like immediate gratification thing which we all kind of have but yes don't want my two-year-old doing that yeah yeah, yeah. so yes he has youtube slash itube yeah <laughs> i love that you call it itube that's well brilliant. he does you know i mean but i'm not gonna lie to you no bullshit motherhood right i'm not gonna lie i Especially when I'm by myself, sometimes I let him have the pad. Absolutely. Yeah. My son, we, I got him a, P, his a PS, PS4 at his dad's house. And at my house, he has a PS4. I don't even know what that is. What it's is a that, PlayStation. PlayStation. Oh, okay. I love how I gesture with my thumbs, yeah, like the like gaming thing. I don't even know how to use it, really. Um, and then he has a Wii, which is um, Nintendo. What, yeah. So we have both. And if he goes in on the PlayStation and plays Fortnite, which is an online thing where they can have headphones on and play with other friends, they hook up and like can hear each other. I'm like, oh my God, yes, I can work for two hours. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know, but I, I'm okay with that. I know he's safe. I know where he is. I know he's with friends and it's okay. And I mean, I'm sure there's like the mommy, the judging mommy brigade that's like, oh, you let your son play, blah, blah, blah. but like, I don't, it's fine. I'm pretty good at not, and I don't know if it's because I had a child when I was older or, or because I've been doing this work for so long, but yeah. I'm pretty good at not giving a shit. Yeah. Um, especially with the mom, ma mom stuff. I, I, this morning, my mother-in-law who you just met, you know, she said she, it's interesting because she asked me some questions about um, anorexia. She read my book and she asked me, um, what did she say? She came in the kitchen and she said something like, you, you worry about your weight, don't you? And I said, I don't. And I really paused to consider the question. I said, no, I don't. And I said, I'm, I'm not, worry isn't the right word. Um, I said, you read my book, right? You know, so I, I said, it's, it's way deeper than that, you know? And then I was, I was t t explaining anorexia, talking to her about that. And, and she said, um, she said, she asked me if it, was from, you know, some bad influences. And I, and I said of like people I was hanging out with. And I said, no, I, I really think a lot of it was because of my dad dying young and I didn't deal with my grief. And anyway, we searched and I started talking about how I just, th this conversation was triggering to me because I so much um, commentary on women's bodies and sizes. I just, I don't, it doesn't sit well with me. And then she said something about, you know, yeah, and I guess we all care too much about what people think. And I said, well, actually, I don't. I mean, not as much as you. And she agreed. <laughs> and I said, I wouldn't have been able to write that book if I had. Yeah. Um, oh, don't get me wrong. I still care what people think, but not right. to the point that it consumes me. So I know, especially with my son, I know I, there are 
pe- people have said shit to me. People think things and like let them. Yeah. And there and I'm clear there's always going to be. Yes. Just like there's going to be people who don't like my book, who don't yes. like your podcast, exactly. who don't like your hair, exactly. who don't, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't need to prevent us from doing what we're drawn to do. You know, it's, no. I think that that's absolutely. Well, I mean, that that's really the crux of every single thing I do. It's like, you can keep going or you can shut down. And so where I really work on telling the truth is, oh, wow, that really hurt my feelings. But I'm going to keep going. I'm going to like let it hurt for five minutes or five hours or five days or whatever it is. But I'm not going to like now I'm never going to write anything again or I'm, you know, I'm going to lock myself in the room or whatever it may be. I'm going to feel it and then keep doing it anyway, as opposed to now, you know, changing what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to a girlfriend today. She's a writer, a brilliant writer. And she was feeling discouraged. And, and uh, she said, you know, I just can't get an agent. I said, well, honey. She wants to get a literary agent because she's a TV writer. How many agents have you tried to get? Well, I emailed those two ones. Yeah, and yeah. Then, 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 like, that sounds like me when I was trying to be an actress. Yeah, totally. Are you joking? I, I, I literally <laughs> would be like, uh, you know, and people would say, well, have you ever done a mailing? I'd go, well, what? Or never. Or, you know, what are you doing to try to get an agent? Or what are you doing? And my answer was nothing. I was waiting for someone to come and find me. Yeah. And not to spoil the ending, but that did not happen. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean I really was I waited at that restaurant like someone's gonna come in and just find me and yeah you 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 have to like take one little step yeah and, and when, then another and when those two agents say no you say okay thank you and exactly. keep going I mean there's thousands of agents there's thousands of other people creating stuff that want to collaborate with you or want a great idea or or you just make it yourself or and which and I'm not minimizing it or making it but I just think yeah it's so easy to shut down like you were saying it's just It is and I always say I get so many yeses but let me tell you how many no's I also get and I ask I do I'm really good at asking and it does feel so bad when you get a no it yeah. does yeah but then you just you get up and you ask again yeah yeah I have so all the blurbs that are on my book it's because i asked i did that because i asked you know and then you get a no and it's easy to make that one no feel like see everyone hates me see i suck see i shouldn't even write you know it's like why (laughs) why i call that the one on the 100 is 100 Mm. people who love you and there's one that doesn't who do you focus on the one and that is like the work of our lives not giving the one all that power making the one you know everyone yeah totally totally so give me so i really want to go on one of your retreats now <laughs> can you come I've, i have actually listeners and readers i have a spot to france may 25th to june 1st the kind of whack wacky person that i am I, my book is coming out june 4th and i get back to the states june 3rd so oh my i'm just God. hoping adrenaline kicks in but yeah so france i have a spot may 25th to june 1st and then um italy is september 21st to the 28th yeah and then and then um you know i do workshops that are three hours in different cities i have a london one june 2nd but the retreats are really where you go in depth and, yeah you know and you know, there's wine tasting, but there's loads of sober people who come just so anyone, you know, listening isn't put off by that either way. There's, it's, it's so beautiful. There's yeah. also like no demographic. There's no age. There's, it's not like all like. And it's men and women. Mainly sometimes, but mainly the retreats on the international ones, especially are just women these days. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It depends. Yeah. Um, but I'd say 99% of the time, Got the it. last bunch I've done, the last time a man came actually was my friend Rich. I met him because he'd come on so many retreats. He came September 2016 to Italy. Charlie was just maybe four months, five months old. And he met a woman at that retreat and they're married now. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. Isn't that girl? Yeah. So fellas, if you're looking exactly. for a quality lady. Yeah. So what, um, and this is just a selfish question for me personally, but give me like a taste of what a day at your retreat would be like. Like what kind of work do you make people do or ask, so, invite people to do? Mm, 
Well, it's different. So the workshop is three hours and it's sort of like everything's consolidated. And in a lot of ways, I love the workshop because I'm in and out, I'm out, you know, and it's just so much less, um, requires so much less of me. I mean, it's so intense, but it's, it's not a week, you know, but the week, you know, each day will have a theme. Um, like a lot of times the first day of the theme's opening, you know, and, um, start off in the morning. I have an assistant. She's amazing. She comes and she teaches meditation and yoga because now that I'm so comfortable and in, in being like, my shit ain't yoga, I bring someone who will offer that if you want that. And so people do or they don't get up at 630 and take her classes. And then mine start at eight and they come in with their journal. And I do a little bit of body movement. Sometimes we sing and we dance, you know, I'll put on journey, don't stop believing or Tom Petty or and I'll give them prompts and a lot of them. Ha and then like, for example, um, you know, w maybe one day the theme is, is release. And so that day is about uh, it's, you know, it's hard. It's hard to I know, summarize so, yeah. it, but that day it'll be about like, you know, what we're letting go of. And so both workshops, I usually teach two in one day, but it depends on if we do a big excursion, then it's like, you know, people, we get back and they're like, yeah, no, we want to go take a nap. Um, but it's just, Oh, and the mornings are always silent, which because the whole retreat is so much talking and noise and chatter that the silent mornings are a gift. The mornings are silent and there's yoga meditation every morning. And then there's my workshop, which is the hybrid, you know, oh, <laughs> um, hybrid stuff that I do. And then we have this beautiful meals and then we'll maybe or maybe not go on an excursion, you know, locally or an hour away or something and then come back and um deep 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 connection deep trust so much so much laughter a lot of grief you know because a lot of people coming are you know have lost children or going through stuff but really more laughter and joy and it's it's so beautiful to see both at once and it's it's not this you know but w what it's not is it's not just, you know, a yoga retreat. It's not like, you know, you're coming. So if anyone tries to sign up and they say, oh, I'm looking for, you know, a retreat where I'm going to like lose weight or work on mastering an arm balance or learn about philosophy, you know, it's, it's great. But that's not. Oh, and I have a lot of friends I could direct them somewhere else. But that's not what mine is. Mine really is about um, being human and what that means with each other. And so it looks different at every retreat. It depends who shows up. You know, this last one I did in the fall, there was five scholarship recipients and one woman had lost two sons at once. One woman had lost her five-year-old to E. coli. One woman, while she was pregnant, her husband got uh, stage four cancer. He died as she was giving birth. <laughs> Um, her letter was so moving because usually I provide scholarships to women who've lost children, but her letter, Ashley's letter, just, just, and then one woman, um, her husband died by suicide two years ago and last June her 17 year old died in a car accident. So I brought her and her 13 year old daughter. So there was five scholarship people and you know, that retreat looked different than any other hack, but let me tell you, they created a flash mob for me, to, uh, Rick Astley, never going to give you up. You know, so there was just like this great, great joy. And, but, but these people, I mean, from this one retreat I did um, last year at some point, they're all re having a reunion in April in Maui. So these friendships are made that are beyond anything I've ever seen. I'd say it's the thing I'm the most proud of. Yeah. You're facilitating deep bonds and connections that may or may not have happened otherwise, not to this level. Yeah. And it's it's something to behold. I mean, it's just... But yeah, we just, we go deep and there's no, um, but it's also, you know, it's not like therapy because there's, it's balanced in with this other stuff and with, with a lot of levity, the sense of humor is the most important thing to me. So like that has to be present, you know, the, and the whole, don't be an asshole. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, there's just this great balance. You've been of, doing the don't be an asshole for a while. I remember the, when you first started doing it. Yeah. It was with, um, <laughs> my friend Annie. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're great. I was with my friend Annie, and we were at the coffee bean having coffee. And I used to stop people. I haven't done this in a while, but I used to stop people on the street. <laughs> so funny. 
I'm such a nerd and, and just go, hey, what made you happy today? And just listen to their answer. And so there was a woman walking down the street who was blind. She had a cane and um, I walked her across the street and I asked her what made her happy. And she said, just waking up. So I sat back down and Annie said, what did you ask her? And I repeated myself. I said, I asked her and she said, just waking up. And Annie said, how did that make you feel? And I said, like an asshole. She said, why? I said, because here we are complaining like, they don't have almond milk, it can't be bean. <laughs> you know, like this privileged assholes. And there's this woman who's blind who truly was just so grateful to be like waking up. And I thought, don't be an asshole and whine about almond milk. Wake up. And so the don't be an asshole really started with this like, well, first of all, have a sense of humor about yourself, but like, be a congruent person. So if you say, you know, I want to be kind or I want to be all these things we want to say. And then we, we walk through the world not being that. Mm. Check in. Yeah. But I also firmly believe that it's okay to be an asshole because we all are sometimes. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. You, me, everybody. Yeah. My two-year-olds, yeah. you know? <laughs> so... Two-year-olds especially, though. Totally they have, they especially. have a wide swath because <laughs> it's just normal. It comes with the territory. But it's just really, it's it's having a sense of humor about yourself. Like, don't be an asshole and talk shit to yourself. Don't be an asshole and, and criticize yourself. Don't be an asshole and forget that you're enough, you know? Just like, I feel like all this work we do in ourselves can be so heavy and hard. And life's already so hard. So have a sense of humor about it. Yeah. It just makes it... You know, not taking ourselves too seriously is yes. everything. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I love that. So, yeah, there's a lot of laughter and there's delicious food and there's beauty hunting, which is just a word I made up to just constantly look for the beauty, which is a, just a, another way of saying pay attention. And, um, oh, God, it's just, it's, it's, it's it magic. Incredible. It, it really amazing. is. Can you talk more about the, the five scholarship uh, people and yeah. where you found them in the foundation that you're working yeah. with? So. Yeah. Well, it's not a nonprofit yet, but it will be one day if I get around to doing that, <laughs> which is one more thing that I haven't done that I've been saying I'm going to do. But um, it started because there was this really um, amazing woman named Julia who I didn't know, but she um, was posting on my Facebook how desperately she needed to get a hold of me. And my son was only a couple months old. And my mom saw it because God bless my mom. And my mom said, this person keeps mess posting. So can you, you know, check in? So I messaged her and I said, I saw your messages. What's up? She said, I'm in the hospital. I'm 41 weeks, six days pregnant. My son was to be induced tomorrow and his heart just stopped. I need help. I need resources. She said, I follow you. I see this community you've created. I see what you do. I pass my son to my mom. Mom, hold Charlie. I'm listening or I'm reading. I'm not on the phone with her at this point. I'm, I'm like, she said, I, I saw, I remember you posting about your friend, Emily, my friend, I gave you that book, Jen, my friend, Emily Rat Blacks lost her son to Tay-Sachs. She said, I remember that. And I've, I've seen you post other essays. I've seen this community you've built. So I need resources. I need help. And I said, I'm on it. And she told me I could share her story. So I did. And like thousands of comments. And so she, I connected her with this community. And then she did this, she sent me the photo, which was just heartbreaking and beautiful. His name was Alexander and, you know. Um, and so it turns out she's in Norway. She said she had met me in person. She had taken my class in Santa Monica. And then she had fallen in love with a guy and moved to Norway. She's Russian. So I said, you're in Norway. This was summertime. I said, why don't you come to my Italy retreat in the fall? You're, you're already, you know, on that side of the world. And so she sent a $500 deposit. and. It was nine, it's nine hours ahead of Norway and she went to bed and I posted on my Facebook and I had been posting about her and I, I said, who wants to send in some donations? I didn't, I didn't have the money out of my pocket just to be able to comp her at this point, but people started sending in money. And so I was able to, by the time she woke up, refund her $500 deposit and tell her she had a spot paid for in a private room, which is like $3,000. And she came to Italy and it was, this was 
the retreat where that guy, Rich, came who ended up getting married, she was incredible and it was painful. And she did everything that I'd hoped she would do. Some days she skipped classes. She got body work. She drank all the wine, ate all the food. She wept. She held my son. And um, it didn't, it certainly didn't make her pain go away, but we, we held her and she allowed us to. And it's profound. And the last night she said, Jen, I, I, I really can't think of anything in the world that would have helped me more than this. This is the, I, I need to pay this forward. So she sent me $500 and said, give this to a woman who's lost a child. And, and I said, I want to keep doing this. Can we call it the Alexander Fund? That was her son's name. So I put that out there and people started sending me money. So I was able to have enough money to bring someone to the next retreat. And then it kept growing. But what happened was I started getting all these emails of people who've lost children. And it was like impossible to pick. So more and more people started donating money. And so this last one I did in September where there was five recipients, I did not have the money to do that. I was just going to go out of my pocket and I, I couldn't say no. And at the very last minute, three women backed out and they were like, just use our money toward um, the scholarship. So I got like the universe, if you want to call it. Wow. I know. Wow. But I mean, I can't do that all the time because like, obviously I have to eat and pay my rent. But the, um, yeah, I, it's unbearable, the pain looking at these emails and, and going, how do I choose? But Ugh. there's so many women. And it really is like, it's some of the most re rewarding and moving and healing and profound stuff I've ever done. Just just having these women be at the retreat. So yeah. it's not like 25 women have all lost their children, but there's, they're sprinkled in there. Right. And it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's been an incredible journey and really being able to bear witness is I think the thing that changes us to the core and especially, you know, a lot of times moms just aren't able to even hear anything about kids or, or be around someone who's lost a child. And it's amazing when we are and we yeah. can just hold space for them. Yes. And that's what they need more than anything is community and, and support and love. And to be able to be there for other people. Yeah. Yeah. And the laughter and the joy. So it wasn't like every session it was like, right. let's rehash what happened. Right. Let's, you know, there were just like dance party and they yeah. were gassed last month yeah. and like, you know, going to San Gimignano and um, going to this castle in France. But we also didn't shy away from the feelings yeah. Yeah. and the pain and the and deep, deep pain. Mm. But we were all changed. Yeah. I mean, and that may sound like a you know corny thing to say, but you you you're changed. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Oh my gosh, let me. Yeah, check I, the time I wish I could do more. Okay, we're good. Um, well, but you are. You are. I mean, you pu you published a book for God's well, sake. I mean, so, I mean, but all of that ripples out yeah, is what I'm saying. Just like, you know, you're sitting here in my apartment. You see how I live. We're in a one bedroom. We have a family bed, and yet I'm like queen of raising money, and I'm constantly like facilitating and and doing all this stuff. I'm somehow I'm really good at. I think because I've built up this this really wonderful group of people who believe in me, and so when I post like, oh, this family's in need, they donate. But I wish I had more so I could help more people mm. <laughs> and like be able to bring more people on retreat. And then it it's, yeah, I just, I, I, I don't feel like we, I would like one more bedroom just so my son could have a room, but I don't really care about any of that stuff, but I would like more money to be able to, I was with these women last weekend and like one of them she was in Section 8 housing. She has this disorder, and I cannot remember the name of it, where she has at least 30 seizures a day. Oh, my gosh. But wait, she can't get disability yet. So she only eats when this other amazing woman, Simone Gordon. Hi, Simone. Simone does all this fundraising for black and brown women who have single moms who have kids with special needs. And that I got to be part of that group, so I help raise money. So Simone raises money for this other woman. And that's the only way she eats. And so it was so humbling to be around that and to think like, wow, I, I, I wish I could just keep, like, you know, fill her fridge every month. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, but luckily that's what's really cool about communities is I, I can, I, you know, Simone created a target um, list and it, I posted it on my Instagram and it got filled. So she is, this person has two months of food. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the magic of, you know, I was not, to, I wasn't bagging on Instagram earlier, but I was saying it's a double edged sword. It can be, but that's the beauty of it is that we've created. Well, I didn't create Instagram, but like, yes, you did. Insta- <laughs> I invented Instagram. Um, is that there is this online village, you know, cause there isn't a village, you know, or I didn't, I mean, most of us moms nowadays don't have that village of family or, and yeah. friends that help us raise our children. And, and it's just, it's hard. It's very isolated. Um, and, and you, you certainly weren't bagging on Instagram, but I think you're right. As like, I, you know, if, if, if you're someone who struggles with like feeling bad about yourself and all you're doing is scrolling and it's making you feel worse than stop. So there's, you know, finding that, um, uh, I don't know, balance is kind of a myth in my <laughs> world, but, uh, I know a lot of times I, I use it as a distraction. I don't want to be present yeah. or I don't want to feel something or I don't want to do something. And so I just scroll mindlessly with, n- I don't even know what I'm looking at. Yeah. Just like this, like zombie yeah. scroll. <laughs> totally. You know? Totally. Yeah. I think that's so common and sad <laughs> yeah and scary and my son is now he's um gonna be 10 he's begging for a phone and i'm not ready and my ex-husband and i talk about it and we're like Ugh, not not yet not yet but you know his peers have phones yeah. with cell service and you know i know there's ways you can you can put uh parent uh not locks but whatever um oh, what's the word i'm looking for where you just you have limitations on what yeah. they can look at, but um, it, it concerns me. But the fact is, it's already happening. I mean, he's already got what I just mentioned the, at home. Then he's got an iPad. Then he's got a Nintendo Switch. Like he's already addicted to digital yeah. shit. So I uh, I don't have an answer. I have no answer. Well, you should. You should have all the answers. <laughs> I um I do. And I wrote a book about it. So if you buy my book, you will, you too will have all the all answers. All the answers. To every question. Speaking of questions, I'm going to ask you three questions that I ask every guest. Everyone gets nervous at this. It's so funny. Um, and when you see it, there's nothing to be nervous about. But um, And then there's a lightning round of questions. So I'm the more first, nervous. The first question, Jen, is... What do you think about when you hear the word MILF? Actress, the blonde actress from that, what was the movie, American Pie? Isn't that when that first became in yeah, our vernacular? Yeah, What's yeah. her name, Jennifer something? It became in our vernac- vernacular, right? That yeah. was the first time I'd ever heard it. So yeah. I think of- Well, it's mother, from a porn genre originally, oh. but that's where it came yeah. into pop culture. But am I so right it with that? It was an American- I don't know who the actress is, but yes, you are right. No, American, American Pie. Pie. Yeah. yeah. So- um, I think of her. Her name yeah. is Jennifer something. Is it? Yes. I'm going to look it up. Yeah, she's hilarious. And she was also in Legally Blonde. She's really funny. Oh, uh, I'm the comedic one. actress. Yeah, yeah. Google it. I'm, if her name isn't Jennifer, I'm going to be mad. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure. I'm Googling Jennifer, American Pie, and Legally oh, Blonde. Jennifer. Um, oh, I know who you're talking about. She's uh, Coolidge. That? Coolidge. We love Jennifer Coolidge. Yeah, she is hilarious. Okay, I, I swear. So I think of her. So she was the original MILF. I mean, am I making that up? Uh, no, I don't. No, I don't think you are. Because I make a lot of things up. <laughs> I just Googled Jennifer Coolidge MILF and it, there's a quote. It says, I like MILF, not cougar. <laughs> um, anyway, I, for, that's who popped in my head. Yes, so love hopefully it. she'll listen. And yes. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? Oh my God, that's amazing. You know, that's like my biggest <laughs> epiphany in life. And it's in my book as you get to change your mind. I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 You get to change your mind, guys. Um, having a child. I was, you know, you can Google me. I was kind of like the poster child pers- person for um, not every woman has to have a kid. And it's your whole either way. And uh, I did not think I was going to, and I changed my mind and, you know, was, I don't, I'm not suggesting that it's that simple. I know people that are dealing with major fertility things, but, um, 
yeah, I changed my mind. Uh, also, the other one was about being a bad, I thought I was just a, at the core, a rotten person. So I changed my mind about that, that that was a bullshit story. How do you define success? Funny you ask. <laughs> um, I always say that I define success by, at the end of the day, when I put down my head in the pillow, I said, I told the truth today. Mm. And um, kind of one of my, my it sounds so douchey to say my quote, but yes, it's uh, my mission statement in life is when I get to the end of my life and I ask one final, what have I done? Let my answer be, I have done love. And so I also really define success, not just telling the truth, but did I do love today? Mm. Did I do love today? And it looks different every day. And, you know, it's just like, but yeah, I mean, thank God I'm not defining success financially, right? <laughs> well, and it doesn't work. We know that. No. Yeah. I mean, I like money. <laughs> but exactly. I'm just saying it doesn't work as a, as the penultimate thing. No way. It's just paper. You know, absolutely. Ocean or desert? Much as I like to be bi-coastal, both. <laughs> Favorite junk food? French fries with mayo. <sighs> Movies or Broadway show? Movies. Daytime sex or nighttime sex? Hmm. Nighttime? Unless I'm really full. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm really, really bad at decision making. I, this is why I was nervous for these. Like, I'm still stuck on ocean or desert. I can we go back to that? I don't know. I get, every time I've asked this question, I get really, even in my own head, I get really panicky. Like, why don't I know? I think ocean, but okay, you can answer both. Okay, both is an answer. Well, it's a, it's a cop out kind of answer, but anyway, I don't think I okay. disagree. Okay, uh, so but yeah, I think generally nighttime sex is just. Unless but really you know what? Fun. I have a two year old and we have a family bed. So any kind of sex yeah, that you can get it in when Absolutely. my you know, my son doesn't have his own room. So yeah. I don't really have a preference anymore. Yeah. And he's at preschool for how many hours every day? Three. Three. Oh, Not that's enough. Oh nope. Yeah. Cat person or dog person? Dog. Have you ever worn a unitard? Yes, but I don't know why. I can't remember why, but I'm sure I have. And when I was trying to stop breastfeeding, my friend Charlotte, hi, Charlotte, sent me something that kind of like that just so Charlie couldn't get in my boobs. Yeah. <laughs> she did. But I hated it. I, I returned it and it was like really expensive and I got $80 or whatever. It oh was, my God. Barney's or something. Shower or bathtub? Bath. Ice cream or chocolate? Ice cream. On a scale of one to 10, how good are Eight. you? Just kidding. <laughs> what? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> How good am I? What? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> On a scale of one to ten, <laughs> how good are you at ping pong? One. <laughs> What's your biggest pet peeve? Oh my god! Passive aggressive behavior. Yeah. Um, flakiness too. Oh, People yeah. say they're going to do something and they don't. Yeah. But I think passive aggressive. I feel like I have so many because I'm always saying that's my biggest pet peeve. But I can't think of. <laughs> you have many, um, many biggest pet peeves. If you could push a button and have perfect skin for the rest of your life, but it would also give you incurable halitosis for the rest of your <laughs> life, would you push it? <laughs> no. <laughs> you thought about it for a I minute. I <laughs> did because I, because I feel like you're in my brain. I, I just like. I've been getting this like red splotchy thing on my face and at first I thought it was just random and then it's been like a year and it flares up. So I've mm -hmm. been to the skin doctor and basically they're like, well, it's seborrheic dermatitis and also rosacea. You have both things. And basically like there's nothing you could do with rosacea. Yeah. And, but also everything I do makes it worse. Like I drink way too much wine and coffee. <laughs> but, um, you know, I haven't had skin issues since I used to pick at my face. Yeah. And that was not so much a skin issue as it was a self-hatred issue. But now I have like this like skin shit in my 40s, you know? <laughs> so I did. I thought about it. And I thought like, well, halitosis, I mean, bad breath, you could like, you know, suck on those little um, yeah. strips and chew yeah. gum. And yeah. but I just, I mean, you know, I get, I lip read, I get in people's faces. I yeah. just think it would be yeah. bad. Yeah. You really thought this through. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> Superpower choice. Invisibility, ability to fly, or super strength? Ability to fly. Invisibility scares me. It's like, I don't, I don't ever want to know what someone's saying behind my back mm. or... No. Yeah. 
It's like, not my business. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Would you rather have a penis where your tailbone is or a third eye? Would the third eye be visible? Yes. yes. Oh, man. And the penis is fully functional and working. A dick. I mean, I think a penis. I don't know. It's just like I could at least hide that. I could wear a long coat yeah. and, you know, stuff and you it in my pants. you could use it sometimes, maybe. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing what that would be like. Yeah. The third eye, just, I don't know. Yes. You know, anytime I, I have, I even like with this stuff I have on my face now, I feel so subconscious when I'm mm. seeing my face. I just feel like I'd be like, they're looking at my third eye. <laughs> <laughs> and they would be. They I would know. Be. The penis is just, not, it would be yeah. more. Um, It'd be a secret uh, trick. Yeah. <laughs> Party trick. Party trick. Party dick. <laughs> Party dick. <laughs> what was the name of your first pet? Oscar. What was the name of the street you grew up on? Drexel Avenue. So your poor name is Oscar Drexel. I love it. And. For my MILF born? Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Ox, Os- Oscar Drexel. Try to say that fast. Oscar Drexel. Oscar Drexel. It's hard. Oscar, yeah. Oscar Drexel. He sounds like, or she, it could be a, it could be male or female. She, he or she sounds like maybe a detective I porn star. Like just, he comes in with his trench coat and his exactly. hat and he's like, hello, miss. I'm Oscar Drexel. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the night of the 25th at the club. <laughs> at, at the strip club. At the strip club. Where you banged your head on the pole. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All comes full circle. Jen, I love you so much. I love you too. Thank you. This Thank you so, so much for being on the show. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Jen. Next week on the show, we have stand-up comic Andrea Abbott, who was wonderful to go and interview. I went to her house in Glendale and with her four dogs, one of whom was very gaseous during the interview, but we had a great time. And just a couple points I wanted to remind you guys to go to my website, uh, milfpodcast.com or jennifertracy.com. Sign up for my free online 21-day uh, writing challenge course. It's called Unlocked, a writer's foundation. It's really fun. I did one this month in April. I'm doing it again in May because I love it so much and I've gotten such great response from it. It's a three-week online course that's totally free just to help you unlock the story that is kind of pulling at you and tugging at you to write it. So join me on that. It's just free to sign up, jennifertracy.com. And also a reminder that this month in April... For any iTunes reviews I receive in April, I'm giving $25 to the Children's Defense Fund. That is the charity that I'm working to donate with this month. That's it. I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll catch you next week on a fresh episode of Milk Podcast.